Great. Thank you very much. Well, hello again. I've, I've actually talked about computation three times before at South by Southwest. And uh, I have to say, when I first agreed to give this talk, I was worried that uh, I would not have anything at all new to say. Um, but actually, there's a huge amount that's new. Um, and in fact, this has probably been the, the single most productive year of, of my life. And I'm excited to be able to talk to you here today about some of the things that I figured out recently. So it's going to be a fairly wild ride, sort of bouncing between very conceptual and very practical, uh, from sort of thousand-year-old philosophy issues to uh, cloud technology that, uh, to use uh, here and now. Basically, for the last 40 years, I've been building sort of a big tower of ideas and technology, working more or less alternately on, on basic science and on technology, uh, using basic science to figure out more technology and uh, technology to, to figure out more science. And I'm happy to say lots of people have used both the science and the technology that I've, I've built. But I think what we've now got is much bigger than before. Uh, actually, talking to people last couple of days at, um, at South By, I'm, I'm excited because probably about three quarters of the people that I've talked to can seriously transform or at least significantly upgrade what they're doing by using the new things that we built. OK. So uh, now I've got to tell you how. Uh, it, it all starts with the Wolfram language, which actually, as it happens, I first talked about by that name two years ago right here at South By. Uh, Wolfram language is a big and ambitious thing, which is actually both a central piece of technology and a repository and realization of a bunch of fundamental ideas. Um, it's also something that you can start to use right now, uh, free on the web. Actually, it runs pretty much everywhere on the cloud, desktops, servers, supercomputers, embedded processors, private clouds, whatever. Let me, uh... Can we bring up a slide? Oh, yes, very good. The... So. From, from an intellectual point of view, the, the goal of the Wolfram language is, is basically to express as much as possible computationally, to provide a very broad way to encapsulate computation and knowledge, and to automate as much as possible what can be done with them. So I've been working on, on building what's now the Wolfram language for, for about three decades. And in Mathematica and Wolfram Alpha, many, many people have used precursors of what we have now. But today's Wolfram language is something different. It's something much broader that I think can be the way that lots of computation gets done sort of everywhere in all sorts of systems and devices and whatever. OK, so let's see it in action. Let's, uh, let's start off by having, let me see. Let's start off by just having a little, a little conversation uh, with the language. So um, uh, this is uh, using what we call a notebook, which is a thing that we invented 26 years ago now. Let's do something trivial. OK, 2 plus 2, good. Let's, uh, let's try something different. You, you may know that it was a pie day on Saturday, 3, 14, 15. And uh, since we are the company that I think has served more mathematical pie than any other in history, um, we had a little celebration about pie day. And let's, let's have the Wolfram language just compute pie for us here. Let's say we compute it to uh, 1,000 places there. Or let's, let's be more ambitious. Let's, uh, let's um, uh, calculate it to a million places. Take a little bit longer. There we go. There's the result. Keeps going. The thumb is quite small there. Keeps going a long time. So, um, or let's say, for example, we could um, let's say we do something like uh, we could pick up uh, the um, uh, Wikipedia article about pi, or we could do something like um, get uh, uh, get a word cloud from uh, from that article. Okay, so needless to say, in the, in the article about pi, oops, in the article about pi, pi itself features prominently. Um, okay, or we could do something different. Let's say we get, um, let's get an image, for example. So, there we go. Not a very good image, but um, uh, there's me. Um, okay, so let's, let's go ahead and... Uh, and do something with that image. For example, let's, um, uh, let's edge detect that image. Percent always means the most recent thing we got. So there's the, there's the edge detection of that image. Or let's say we make a um, uh, morphological graph 
from that image. So now we'll make some kind of network. Oh, that's quite impressionistic. OK. Um, or um, let's say we can make something. Let's try and make something here that um, uh, kind of controls, sort of automatically make a little user interface here that controls kind of the um, degree of edginess that we have here. So there I am. And uh, now we can adjust this, and we'll make, uh, uh, make, make things um, uh, change there. Well, uh, oh, maybe we can get, um, let's, let's do something different here. Let, let's get a, um, uh, just a, a table of all of those, a um, uh, bunch of results from, from different levels of edginess in that picture. OK, so there we go. And now, for example, we can say, let's take all of those images and stack them up and make a 3D image. So there we have that. And now you know, we can move around here. Well, oh, somewhere. There I am. Um, so <laughs> thanks. So, so the Wolfram language has, has zillions of different kinds of algorithms built in. Uh, it's also got real world knowledge and data. So for example, I could uh, just say something like um, planets and uh, uh, that will now be a, um, we, we sort of ask about it in natural language, that will now be a representation of planets. So I could say, give me a list of entities, and there's a list of planets. Uh, for example, I could now say, um, uh, give me an image of each of those entities. So now I'll get um, uh, some images of planets there. For example, I could now say, if I wanted to, I could say, take, uh, uh, it knows all sorts of things. So let, let's say we could ask it, you know, what are the masses of those planets? OK, there are the masses of the planets. Um, now we could, for example, make a little infographic showing um, uh, all the various planets um, arranged so that they are of a size corresponding to their mass. So I think it's fairly amazing that we can use just that, that tiny amount of code to make something like this. But let, let's go on a bit. Let's, let, let's, um, let's see, for example, where, let's see where the internet thinks that my computer is right now. Uh, we could, for example, say, you know, what's, um, uh, when's sunset going to be um, at this position on this day? Or for example, we could say, take uh, sunset time minus now. That's 8.3 hours from now. Um, or we could get, uh, uh, let's say, a map of, um, let's try and get um, something like a map of um, uh, 10 miles around the center of uh, Austin here. So let's, let's do that. Um, so now we're using data uh, about maps. Or let's say, for example, that we want to get um, a whole series of maps. Um, let's do something where we say, let's do powers of 10 kind of uh, regions around, um, around here. Uh, let's, oh, I have to find my mouse. There we go. Um, so now this is going to make a, a series of maps going out uh, from Austin uh, to, um, and actually by this point we are, we're covering almost the whole world um, around Austin other than that little spot in the Indian Ocean there. Um, or we could, for example, let's, um, let's say we go, um, uh, let's, let's go off planet, for example, and let's say we do the same kind of thing for, um, uh, we ask for the Apollo 11 landing site and let's show, um, uh, a thousand miles around the Apollo 11 landing site on, on the moon. Um, do all kinds of things. Let, let's say we want to, let's try something in a different kind of domain. Um, let's, uh, let's get a list of uh, Van Gogh's artworks, another kind of thing that we would know about. Um, and let's say we want to, um, let's take, uh, let's say the first 20 of those and let's uh, get images of those. Might take a little while. Let's see, here we go. Um, so there are some images. And now we can, uh, for example, we can say, um, uh, take those images. And now we can say, OK, what, what are the dominant colors that were used in those images? Um, so I have to do a little bit of computation here. Um, and maybe we can go ahead and say, let's, let's plot those, those colors in a chromaticity diagram in 3D. So we get the result. So this is kind of showing us what the, what the distribution of colors in those particular pictures is. So I think it's fairly amazing what can be done with, with small amounts of uh, Wolfram language code. Um, it's really a whole new situation for programming. I mean, it's, it's sort of a dramatic change, 
I mean, the, the traditional idea has been to start from a fairly small programming language and then write fairly big programs to do what you want. The idea in the Wolfram language is to make the language itself, in a sense, as big as possible um, and to build in as much as we can and, in effect, to automate as much as possible of the, of the process of programming. So this is kind of the, the, uh, the, the types of things that, that the Wolfram language um, deals with. And we, by now, we've got thousands of uh, built-in functions, tens of thousands of models and methods and algorithms and so on, and, uh, and carefully curated data on, on thousands of different domains. And I basically spent nearly 30 years of my life um, kind of keeping the design of all of this clean and consistent. It's been really interesting, and the, and the result is really satisfying because now we have something that's incredibly powerful that we're also able to use to develop the language itself at an increasing rate. So here's something uh, recently that we did to have kind of some fun with all of this. It's called uh, Tweeter Program. Let's see if I can show you it. So the idea here is uh, you send a whole program as a tweet, get back the result of running it. Um, if you stop by our booth at the trade show, you can pick up one of these little galleries of tweetable programs. Um, but uh, let's see. We've got here, here's just a collection of some, um, uh, some tweetable programs. And remember, every one of these programs is less than 140 characters long um, and uh, does all kinds of uh, different, different types of things. So maybe. Um, we also, uh, to sort of celebrate tweetable programs, we also have a little, uh, uh, let's see if I can pull that up. Um, we have a little, there we go, little uh, card deck that we made of uh, a program for every card. So, you know, if I press the, um, uh, here's, a, here's, a, here's an example of one of those tweetable programs and we can run it and uh, that's what that particular program does. And that's, that's the whole thing. The, the, um, uh, just that little piece of code up there. And uh, I think it's fairly amazing what can be done with kind of tweet length programs in the Wolfram language. And in other languages, you'd probably still be specifying headers and things at 140 characters. So, you know, if, if you look at these tweetable programs, um, they are usually rather easy to understand. You can kind of just read the words to get a pretty good idea of, uh, of how they will work. And you might think, okay, you know, it's like, Kids could do this. Well, actually, that's, that's true. And in fact, I think um, this is a sort of an important moment um, for, uh, for programming when the same thing has happened uh, as has happened in the past for things like video editing and so on. I mean, we've automated enough of the process of programming that sort of fancy professionals don't really have any advantage um, over kids in learning programming. So one thing I'm, I'm keen on right now is to use our language as a way to teach computational thinking to a very broad range of people. Uh, soon we'll have something we call Wolfram Programming Lab, which you can, which you can use free on the web. Um, and uh, let's see. The, um, it's kind of an immersion uh, language learning for the Wolfram language, um, where you see lots of uh, sort of small uh, working examples of uh, of Wolfram language programs that you get to modify and run. So I, I think it's a, it's a pretty powerful thing for education because it's, it's not just teaching programming, it's sort of immediately bringing in lots of other real world stuff and integrating with other things kids are learning and, uh, and really teaching kind of a computational thinking approach to, to everything. So let's take a look at a couple of examples. Let's see, let's try, okay, it's been pie day. Let's look at pie necklaces. So here, the, the basic idea is that um, uh, you, here's a little piece of code. You can run it, see what it does. You could maybe uh, modify. Let's go down here. Maybe we can um, uh, pick this piece of code here. You can run it. You can maybe modify that, um, that number and see what it does. Uh, you could uh, say, show the details, and it'll tell you what's going on, um, and so on. And uh, maybe we can try another example. Let's say we do something a little bit more real world. There's a good example. Um, how about that one? Um, let's say, where, where can you see from a particular skyscraper? So for instance, let's try, um, let's try this here. Uh, this will show us the visible region from the Empire State Building. And you could go ahead and change lots of uh, uh, parameters of this and, and uh, 
uh, and see what happens. Or you can go down and, and look at challenges uh, where it's asking you to, to try and um, uh, do, do other kinds of related computations. So I, I hope lots of uh, people, kids and otherwise, will, will have fun with the explorations that we've been making. Um, I think it's, it's a pretty good thing for education because it's kind of a mixture of sort of the precise thinking uh, of math and sort of the creativity of something like writing. And by the way, when um, uh, in the programming lab, for example, we can watch programs people are trying to write and uh, do all kinds of education analytics inside. I might mention that for people who don't, um, don't know English, um, we, uh, see if I can find it here, um, uh, we actually also are in a position to, to annotate um, programs in a variety of other languages and so on. So, well, I think there are lots of great things that are going to happen when, when more people learn to sort of think computationally using the Wolfram language. Um, of course, millions of people already use our technology every day without any of that. Um, they're just typing pure natural language into Wolfram Alpha um, or saying things to Siri that gets sent to Wolfram Alpha. Um, I guess one big breakthrough has been being able to use our very, do very precise natural language understanding using both new kinds of algorithms and using our huge knowledge base. And using all our knowledge and computation capabilities to generate sort of automated reports for things that people ask about. So whether it's uh, questions, let's just do some, some uh, Wolfram Alpha kinds of uh, queries, whether it's something like um, uh, demographic questions, Boy, the network is a little slow here, okay. Um, whether it's some, some demographic question or whether it's some, some question about, uh, uh, let's say, um, oops. Yeah, there we go. that's a good one. Um, let's say some question about airplanes um, or some question about, that's showing um, airplanes currently overhead, at least where, where uh, the internet thinks my computer is. Or for example, um, uh, we can ask about some genome sequence. Uh, there's a base pair sequence, and now it will go and uh, look that up on the human genome and try and find whether that particular random base pair sequence occurs somewhere on the human genome. So those are, those are a few sort of um, things that we can do um, in Wolfram Alpha. And uh, we've been uh, covering thousands of different domains of knowledge um, adding new things all the time. Uh, by the way, there are now uh, lot, quite a lot of uh, large organizations that have internal versions of Wolfram Alpha that include their own data um, as well as our public data. And it's, it's really nice because all types of people can kind of make drive-by queries um, in natural language without ever having to kind of um, go to their IT departments and so on. You know, being able to use natural language is central to the actual Wolfram language, too, because when you want to refer to something in the real world, like a city, for example, uh, you can't be sort of going to documentation to find out the name of the city. You just want to type in natural language and then get that interpreted as something precise, which is, which is exactly what you can now do. So, for example, we would type something like uh, NYC, and that would be understood as uh, the, the entity in New York City. And we could go and ask things like, uh, you know, what's the, um, uh, what's the population of that? And it will tell us the result, and so on. So th there's an awful lot that goes into sort of making the Wolfram language work, not only tens of millions of lines of algorithmic code and terabytes of curated data, but also some, some, some I think, big ideas. Probably the biggest idea is the idea of symbolic programming, uh, which has been kind of the core of what's become the Wolfram language right from the very beginning. Here's the basic point. In the Wolfram language, everything is symbolic. It doesn't have to have any particular value. It can just be a thing. So if I just typed X in most computer languages, they'd say, help, I don't know what to do with that. I don't know what it is. But the Wolfram language just says, OK, it, X is X. It's symbolic. 
And, and the point is that basically anything can be represented like this. You know, something like, uh, if, you know, if I type in Jupiter, it's just uh, a symbolic thing. Or for example, if I were to um, uh, put in an, an image here, it's just a, um, uh, a symbolic thing. And, uh, or for example, I could say, um, I could ask about, uh, I could have something like a, a slider, a user interface element. Again, it's just a, a symbolic thing. And uh, now when you compute, you can sort of do anything with anything. So you could like do math with, with x, um, or you could do uh, uh, math with, um, uh, with an image of Jupiter here, um, or you could uh, like do math with um, uh, a slider here, um, or, or whatever. So it's taken me a really long time, actually, to understand just how powerful this idea of symbolic programming really is. Every few years, I understand it a little bit more. Long ago, we understood how to represent programs symbolically and documents and interfaces so that they all become sort of instantly computable with. Recently, one of the big breakthroughs has been understanding how to represent not only operations and content symbolically, but also their deployments. OK, so there's, there's one thing I need to explain first. We, what I've been showing you here today has mostly been using a desktop version of the Wolfram language, um, though it's going to the cloud to get things from our knowledge base and so on. Well, with great effort, we've also built a full version of the whole language in the cloud. So let me use, um, uh, let me use that um, interface here just, just through a web browser. So I can just go, um, uh, let's see. Um, let's go here. OK, so now I'm, I'm going to have the, the exact same experience, so to speak. Let's just check things are working. OK, that's a good sign. You know, we can type uh, whatever we type. Um, we could, uh, and we can, do, um, we can do all these same kinds of things uh, purely in the cloud, just, just through a web browser. You know, actually, in my, in my 40 years of writing software, I don't believe there's ever been a development environment that is as crazy as the web and the cloud. Um, and it's taken us a huge amount of effort to, to kind of hack through the jungle to get the functionality that, that we want. We're pretty much there now. Um, and of course, the great news for people who, uh, who just use what we've built is that they don't have to hack through the jungle themselves because we've already done that. Um, but OK. So you can use the Wolfram language directly in the cloud, and that's really useful. Uh, but you can also deploy other things in the language through the cloud. Like, uh, let's try, let's go, um, let's go back here. Um, like, you know, uh, cat pictures are popular on the internet, right? So we, let's see if I can get this, um, uh, let's see if I can get the right thing to happen here. Here we go. Um, So we can let, let me let me write, run this piece of code, um, and uh, this will create. It will deploy something to the cloud. The thing it deploys to the cloud is something that will run that uh, will create a form and then run that little piece of code here. Uh, the form will say it's going to have a field that asks for a cat and it's going to look for a cat breed. Let's let's run that form here. So now we can type in let's say Siamese. Um, and it will go back and run that code, uh, hopefully. That's very surprising. It should be very fast. OK. Well, there's a picture of a cat. Um, the, uh, so oh, let, let's, let's, for example, let's go back here and um, make that code a little bit more elaborate. Um, let's say, let's just add in another, another field here. Again, we deploy to the cloud. And now we should get something where we have you know, something like this. Um, we have a cat. And we hopefully have uh, a cat at an angle there. And so now uh, we can, um, uh, that, that was making sort of a little web app, which we can also deploy on mobile and so on. Um, we can uh, also make an API if we want to. So let's, let's try doing that. Um, let's do the same, oops, let's use the same piece of code. Actually, the easiest thing to do would be just to edit that piece of code there. 
and change this from being a form to being an API. Um, and now, now the thing that we have will be an API um, that we can go and fill in parameters to. We can say um, cat equals manx, um, you know, angle equals uh, 300 or something. Um, and now we can run that, and uh, there's a, another cat at an angle. Um, actually, we can, we can go ahead and, um, and take what we have here. Uh, that, so that was, that was an API that we just created that could be used um, uh, by anybody in the, in the cloud. Um, we could say if we wanted to, we could uh, uh, ask to create embed code for this so that we could run it, let's say, inside Java. And here's now the code for calling that, um, uh, that API from inside a Java program so that you can sort of effectively knit Wolfram language functionality right into any project that you're doing in, in any language. Um, in this particular case, you're calling code in our cloud. Um, there are also other ways you can set this up too. You can have a private cloud. You can have a version of the Wolfram engine that's on your computer. You can even have the Wolfram engine a library that you can um, explicitly link into a program you've written. Um, and this stuff works on mobile too. You can deploy an app that works on mobile. You can uh, even a complete APK file for Android if you want. Um, there's, there's lots of depth to all of this software engineering stuff. Um, it's, uh, to me, it's rather wonderful how the Wolfram language is, manages to simplify and automate so much of it. I mean, I, I get to see this story kind of, of automation um, up close at our company every day because we have all these projects, all these things we're building, huge amount of stuff that you might think we'd need thousands of people to do. Um, but uh, you see, we've been, we've been automating things and, and then automating our automation and so on for a quarter of a century now. And so we still have, only have a little private company with about, 300, about 700 people and um, uh, lots of automation. And it, it's, it's fairly spectacular to see. When we automate something, like say a type of web development, projects that used to be really painful and take a couple of months suddenly become really easy and take like a day. Um, and from a management point of view, it's, it's sort of, it's great how that changes the level of innovation that you attempt. So let me give you a little example from a couple of weeks ago. We were talking about what to do for Pi Day. And we thought it would be fun to put up a website where people could type in their birthdays and uh, find out where in the digits of Pi those dates show up and then make a cool t-shirt based on that. Um, well, okay, this is not a corporately critical activity, but if it's easy, why not do it? Well, with all our automation, uh, it is pretty easy. And uh, for example, let's see, here is the code um, that uh, got written to create that website. Not particularly long. Uh, somewhere here, it'll probably deploy to the cloud, and there it's calling the Zazzle API and so on. Um, actually, there were, in a sense, uh, let, let me show you the actual website that got made there. Um, so here's the website, and you can type in, if I can get back here, you can type in your birthday in some format, uh, and then it'll go off and um, uh, try and find, find that birthday in the digits of pi. There we go. Found my birthday in that digit position, and there's a, a custom created uh, image showing me in, in pi and letting me go off and uh, get a t-shirt with that on it. Um, Actually, zero programmers were involved in building this. As it happens, it was done by our art director, um, and uh, it went live uh, a couple of days ago before Pi Day and has been merrily serving hundreds of thousands of custom t-shirt designs to, to Pi enthusiasts around the world. Um, it's actually interesting to see how large-scale code development happens in the Wolfram language. I mean, there's an Eclipse-based IDE and so on, and we're soon going to release uh, a bunch of integration with Git that we've used internally. Um, but one thing that's, that's very different from under other languages is that people tend to write their code um, in, uh, uh, in notebooks um, like this. And um, they can put text and graphics and uh, whatever right there with the code. Um, they can use notebooks to, do, um, to make uh, structured tests if they want to. Like there's a, a, a testing notebook with, with various tests in it. We could run those tests and so on. Um, and uh, the, um, so they can uh, also use notebooks to make templates for computable documents where you can sort of directly embed 
uh, symbolic Wolfram language code that will get executed to make static or interactive documents that you can deliver as reports and so on. Well, by the way, one, one of the really nice things about this, uh, this whole ecosystem is that if you see a finished result, say an infographic, there's a standard way to include, include a kind of compute back link that goes right back to the notebook where that graphic was made. So you see everything that's behind it and say, start, uh, start being able to use the data yourself, which is useful for things like data publishing for research or like uh, data journalism. OK, so talking of data, a couple of weeks ago, we launched uh, what we call our data drop. Um, and uh, the, um, uh, the idea is to let anything, particularly connected devices, um, easily drop data into our cloud and then immediately make it, uh, make it meaningful and accessible uh, to the Wolfram language everywhere. So someplace here, there's a little device. That's a little device that um, uh, measures, actually, I think this particular one only measures light level, which is kind of boring. Um, but uh, uh, in any case, that, that device is connected via Wi-Fi to our cloud, um, and it's measuring, um, and we can go ahead, and, uh, and, and it's then dropping its data into, um, into our, our um, data drop. And so this should be the, the name of the data bin corresponding to that device. OK, it hasn't collected very much data yet. Um, but we could go ahead, for example, and um, uh, just make a plot of um, the data that it's collected. So this will be showing, hopefully. Um, there we go. That's really boring. OK, That's, that was the light level as seen by that device. And I think it's just sat there, and the lights got turned on, and then it's been at a fixed light level. Sorry, not very exciting. We could probably see, um, uh, probably see here, we can just make a histogram of that data. And again, it's going to be really boring in this particular case. Um, you know, we, we have all this data about the world from our knowledge base integrated right into our language. Um, and now with the data drop, uh, you can integrate data from any device that, that, that you want. We've got a whole inventory of different kinds of devices that we've been making for the last, uh, last couple of years. Um, and uh, once you get data into this data drop, you can use it wherever the Wolfram language is used, like in Wolfram Alpha or Siri or, or whatever. It's, it's sort of really critical that the Wolfram language can represent different, different types of data in a standard way, because that means you can immediately do computations, combine data bins, whatever. Um, I have to say that just being able to sort of throw data into this Wolfram data drop is really convenient. Like, of course, we're throwing data from the Pi Day website into a data bin. And uh, that means that we can, uh, um, uh, for example, it's just one line of code here, if I can get back here. Um, it's just, just one line of code to go and uh, uh, be able to work out um, where in the world people have been interested in Pi and generating Pi t-shirts from and, and, and so on. Uh, you might know that uh, I've long been an enthusiast of, of personal analytics in fact, somewhat to my surprise, I think I'm, I'm the, the human who's collected more data on themselves than anyone else. Um, and uh, so, for example, uh, here's, a, here's a dot for every piece of outgoing email that I've sent in the past quarter century. Um, now, with our data drop, I'm starting to uh, accumulate even more data. Um, I think I'm already in the double digits in terms of number of uh, data bins. Um, and uh, like, for example, here's one. See if I can pull this up. Uh, this should be a data bin from the, uh, uh, my heart rate uh, during Pi Day. We try to figure out what was happening at different, at different stages in the, in the day there. Um, I don't think there's a no huge peak right at the Pi moment of the century, unfortunately. Um, the, uh, so OK, with, with all this data coming in, what are we supposed to, what are we supposed to do with it? Well, within the Wolfram language, we've got uh, all this visualization and analysis capability. One of our goals is to be able to do the best data science automatically without needing to take sort of data scientist time to, to do it. And one area where we've been working on that a lot is in machine learning. So let's say that you want to classify pictures into uh, ones that are, um, let's say, classify, um, oops. Let's say we want to classify pictures um, that are going to be day versus night pictures. Let me see if I can pull that up. That's not good. This is 
something. It's hard to type again. There we go. OK, so here, here I've got a little tiny training set of, um, of pictures uh, corresponding to um, scenes that are day or night. And I just have one little function in the Wolfram language, classify, which is going to build a classifier um, to determine whether a picture is, is a day or a night picture. So there I've got the classifier. Now I can just apply that classifier to a collection of pictures. And now it will tell me, um, according to that classifier, are those pictures day or night? So uh, the way this is working, we're kind of automatically figuring out what type of machine learning to use so that uh, it, it, it is just one function to, um, uh, to do this. We've got lots of built-in classifiers as well, like you can uh, uh, all, all sorts of different kinds of things. Let me show you a new thing that's um, just coming together now, which is image identification. And um, I'm going to live dangerously and try and do a, a live demo of some, um, some very new technology. And actually, I realize I need to, I asked somebody to go, go to Walmart and buy a random pile of stuff to try for image identification. So this is, this is probably going to be really horrifying. Let's see, let's see, what, um, let's see what happens here. Let, let's, um, let's, first of all, let's set it up so that I can actually capture some images. Um, OK. I'm going to give it a little bit of a better chance by having it not have too funky a background. All right, let us try one banana. Let's try capturing a banana, and let us see what happens. If I say uh, image identify um, in our language, that thing. Da -da -da -da. Usually it's very fast. This is a bad sign. OK, that's good. All right. We have to tempt fate here, and we have to try a couple of other things. Let us try, what is that? Hmm. that? That appears to be a, let's see what it thinks this is. Um, this, could, this could get really bad here. Um, OK, let's see what, what, that, what that comes out as. Um, A goat. <laughs> okay, it's um. Let's try one more. Um, uh, how about this? Let's see. I think to give it the best chance, let's try doing that. Um, okay. And let's try image identifying that thing. Okay, it says it's an Africa. Let's let's look at the let's look at the tag. Any, oh wow, okay. The, I knew something. There we go. It says it's an African violet. That's pretty cool. Okay, so so actually, I'm I'm. Um, uh, this does amazingly well most of the time, and uh, what to me is the most interesting. We can go and try it on other things too, but but. Um, uh, the most interesting thing to me is that when it makes mistakes, like with the Triceratops, um, the mistakes are, are really very human-like. I mean, they're kind of mistakes that a person might plausibly make. And actually, I think what's going on here is, is, is pretty exciting. You know, 35 years ago, I, I wanted to figure out, you know, how brain-like things, and I was studying neural nets and so on. I did all kinds of computer experiments, and I ended up simplifying the underlying rules that I looked at and wound up studying not neural nets, but things called cellular automata, which are kind of like the simplest possible programs. And what I discovered is that if you look at that in that sort of computational universe of programs, there's a whole zoo of possible behaviors that you see. So for example, um, Here's an example of, of just a, a bunch of different cellular automata. Each one is a different program showing different kinds of behavior. Um, even when the programs are incredibly simple, there can be incredibly complex behavior. Like, there's an example. We can go and um, see what it does. And uh, that discovery kind of led me on this path to developing a, a whole um, new kind of science that I wrote a big book about a number of years ago. 
um, that's ended up having applications all over the place. And for example, over the last decade, it's been pretty neat to see that the idea of modeling things using programs has been winning out over the idea that sort of dominated exact science for about 300 years of modeling things using mathematical equations. And what's also been really neat to see is the extent to which we can discover new technology just by kind of mining this computational universe of simple programs. Uh, knowing some goal we have, we might sort of sample a trillion programs to find one that's good for our particular purposes. So that purpose could be like making art, or it could be making some new image processing or some new natural language understanding algorithm or whatever. Well, okay, so there's a lot that we can uh, model and uh, build with simple programs. Uh, but people have often said somehow, somehow the brain must be special. It must be doing more than that. Back 35 years ago, I could get neural networks to make uh, little attractors or classifiers, but I couldn't really get them to do anything terribly interesting. And over the years, I, I actually wasn't terribly convinced by most of the applications of things like neural nets that I saw. But just recently, some threshold has been passed. And like the image identifier I was showing, is pretty much using the same ideas as 35 years ago, with, with a bunch of good engineering tweaks and perhaps a, a nod actually to cellular automata too. Uh, but the amazing thing is that just doing pretty much the obvious stuff with today's technology just works. I couldn't have predicted that when, uh, when that would happen. Uh, but looking at it now, it's sort of shocking because we're now using millions of neurons, tens of millions of training images, thousands of trillions of the equivalent of neuron firings. And although the engineering details are almost as different as birds versus airplanes, the orders of magnitude are pretty much just the same as for us humans when we learn to identify images. Well, for me, it's, this has sort of been the, it's, it's sort of the missing link for AI. There are so many things now that we can do vastly better than humans using computers. I mean, if you put, you know, put a Wolfram Alpha inside a Turing test bot, and you'll be able to tell instantly that it's not a human, because it knows too much, it can compute too much. But um, there have been these tasks like image identification that we've never been able to do with computers, but now we can. And by the way, the way people have thought this would work for 60 years is pretty much the way it works. We just didn't have the technology to see it until now. So does this mean that we should just you know, use neural nets for everything now? Well, no. Uh, here's the thing. There are some tasks, like image identification, that each human effectively learns to do for themselves based on what they see in the world around them. But that's not everything humans do. There's another very important thing, pretty much unique to our species. Uh, we have language. We have a way of communicating symbolically that lets us take knowledge acquired by one person and broadcast it to, to other people. And that's kind of how we built our civilization. Well, how do we make computers use that idea too. Well, they have to have a language that represents the world and that they can compute with. And conveniently enough, that's exactly what the world from language is, is trying to be, and that's what I've been working on for the last 30 years or so. Um, you know, there's all this abstract computation out there that can be done. Just go sample, go sample cellular automata out in the computational universe. But the question is, how does it relate to our human world, to what we as humans know or care about? Well, what's happened is that humans have tried to boil things down to describe the world symbolically using language and linguistic constructs. Uh, we've seen what's out there in the world, and we've come up with words which, uh, to, to, to describe things. We, we have a word like bird, which refers abstractly to a large collection of things that are birds. And by now, in English, we've got maybe 30,000 words that we commonly use that are the raw material for our description of the world. Well, it's interesting to compare that with the Wolfram language, for example. In English, there's been a whole evolution over thousands of years to settle on the perhaps convenient, uh, but often incoherent language structure that we have. In the Wolfram language, we, I guess particularly I, have been working hard for many, many years, sort of keeping everything as consistent and coherent as possible. And now we've got 5,000 or so sort of core words or functions, together with lots of other words that describe specific entities. And in the process of developing the language, what I've been doing explicitly is a little like what's implicitly happened in English. 
I've been looking at sort of all those computational things and processes out there and trying to understand which of them are sort of common enough that it's worth giving names to them. You know, this idea of symbolic representations seems to be uh, pretty critical to human rational thinking. Um, and it's really interesting to see how the structure of a language can affect how people think about things. We see a little bit of that in human natural language, but the effect is, seems to be much larger in computer languages. Um, for me, as a language designer, it's, it's sort of fascinating to see the patterns of thinking that open up when people, for example, start really understanding our Wolfram language. Some people might say, why are we using computer languages at all? Why not just use human natural language? Well, for a start, computers need something to talk to each other in. But one of the things I've worked hard on in the Wolfram language is making sure that it's easy not only for computers, but also for humans to understand, kind of a bridge between computers and humans. And what's more, it turns out that there are things that human natural language, as it's evolved, just isn't very good at expressing. I mean, think about programs, for example. There are some programs that, yes, can easily be represented by a little piece of English, but a lot of programs are really awkward to state in English. But they're very clean in the Wolfram language, for example. So I think we need both. Some things it's easy to say in English, some in the Wolfram language. But, but back to things like image identification. I mean, that's a task that's really about going from all the stuff out there, in this case in the visual world, and finding how to make it symbolic, how to describe things abstractly with words. Now here's the thing, inside the neural net, one thing that's happening is that it's implicitly making distinctions, in effect putting things into categories. In the early layers of the net, those categories look remarkably like uh, the early stages of human visual processing, and we actually have pretty decent words to describe the categories, things like round objects and pointy objects and so on. But pretty soon there are categories implicitly being used that we don't have words for. It's, it's interesting that in the course of civilization, uh, in the course of history, our civilization gradually does develop new words for things. I mean, like in the past few decades, we've started talking about you know, fractal patterns, for example. Before then, those kinds of you know, tree-like structures didn't really get noticed or identified because we didn't have words for them. So our machines are going to discover a lot of categories that our civilization has not come up with. Um, I've started calling these things a uh, rather, rather pretentious name, post-linguistic emergent concepts. Um, or PLEX for short. Um, I think we can make sort of a meta framework for things like this within the Wolfram language, for example, but I think, I think PLEX are part of the way our computers start to really extend the traditional human worldview. By the way, before we even get to PLEX, there are issues with concepts that humans already understand perfectly well. See, in the Wolfram language, for example, we've got representations of lots of things in the world, and we can turn the vast majority of things that, for example, people ask Wolfram Alpha into precise symbolic forms. But we still can't turn an arbitrary human conversation into something symbolic. So how would we do that? Well, I think we have to break it down into some kind of semantic primitives, basic structures. So some, like many fact statements, we already have in the Wolfram language. And some, like mental statements, like, you know, I think or I want, we don't. It's a funny thing. I've been working recently on designing this kind of symbolic language and of course, people have tried to do things like this before, but the state of the art um, is, is actually mostly from a shockingly long time ago. I mean, like in the, in the 1200s, there was a chap called Ramon Lull who started working on this. In the 1600s, people like Gottfried Leibniz and John Wilkins. It's, it's quite interesting to look at what those guys figured out with their philosophical languages or whatever. Of course, they never had an implementation substrate like we do today. Um, but they understood quite a lot about ontological categories and so on. And, and looking at what they wrote really highlights, actually, what's the same and what changes in the course of history. I mean, all their technology stuff is, of course, horribly out of date. But most of their stuff about the human condition is still just as valid as, 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 as then, although they certainly they had a lot more focus on mortality than we do today. So today, one interesting challenge is that we really need to uh, attribute sort of almost person-like internal state to, um, uh, to machines, not least because, as it happens, the early applications of all this everyday discourse stuff will be to things uh, uh, we want for people talking to consumer devices and cars and, and, and so on. OK, well, I could talk uh, some about very practical kind of here and now technology that actually is going to be available starting next week, as it happens, for making what we call PLIs, or Programmable Linguistic Interfaces. But instead, let's talk more about sort of the big picture and about the future. 
So the, the way I see things, sort of throughout history, there's been a, a thread of using technology to automate more and more of what we do. Humans define goals, and then it's the job of technology to automatically uh, to achieve those goals as well as possible. A lot of what we're trying to do with the Wolfram language is, in effect, to give people a good way to describe goals. Then our job is to do the computations or make the external API requests or whatever to have those goals be achieved. So in any possible computational definition of the objectives of AI, we're getting awfully close to achieving those objectives. Um, and actually, in many areas, we've gone far beyond anything like human intelligence. But here's the point. Imagine we have this box that sits on our desk, and it's able to do all those intelligent things humans can do. The problem is, what does the box choose to do? Somehow, it has to be given goals or purposes. And the point is that there are, there are no absolute goals or purposes. Any given human might say, the purpose of life is to do x. But we know that there's nothing kind of absolute like that about that. Purpose ends up getting defined by society and history and civilization. I mean, there are plenty of things people do or want to do today that would have seemed absolutely inconceivable 300 years ago. It's interesting to see sort of the complicated interplay between the progress of technology, the progress of our descriptions of the world through you know, memes and words and so on, and the evolution of human purposes. To me, actually, the path of technology seems fairly clear. The evolution of human purposes is a lot less clear. I mean, on the technology side, more and more of what we do ourselves will be, will be able to outsource to machines. Uh, we've already outsourced lots of kinds of mechanical thinking, like uh, you know, doing, doing math or something. Uh, we're well on the way to outsourcing lots of things about memory. Uh, also, now, lots of things about judgment. People might say, well, we'll never outsource creativity. Actually, some aspects of that are among the easier things to, to outsource. We can get lots of inspiration for music or art or whatever just by looking out into this sort of computational universe of possible programs. And it's only a matter of time before we can automatically combine those things with knowledge and judgment about, about the human world. You know, a lot of our use of technology in the past has been kind of on demand. Uh, we're going to see much more and more preemptive use where our technology predicts what we will want to do then suggests it. It's sort of amusing to me when people sort of talk about the machines taking over. Well, here's the scenario that I think will actually happen. I mean, it's like with GPSs in cars. Most people, like me, just you know, follow what the GPS tells them to do. Similarly, when there's something that's saying, you know, pick out that food on the menu or talk to that person in the crowd, much of the time we'll just do what the machine tells us to do partly because the machine is basically able to figure out a lot more than we can. So it's going to get complicated when machines are kind of acting collectively across a whole society, effectively implementing in software all those things that political philosophers have talked about theoretically. But uh, even at an individual level, it's very complicated to understand the goal structure. Yes, the machines can sort of help us be, be ourselves but better, amplifying and streamlining things we want to do and directions we want to go. You know, in, in the world today, we've, we've still got lots of scarce resources in many parts of the world, much less than in the past, but some resources are still scarce. I mean, the most, the most notable, the obvious of those is probably time. I mean, we have finite lives, and that's kind of a, a key part of lots of aspects of human motivation and purpose. I mean, it, it's surely going to be the biggest discontinuity ever in human history when we achieve effective human immortality. And by the way, I have absolutely no doubt that we will achieve that. Um, it's, I wish more progress was getting made on things like cryonics, so my generation has a better chance of making it to that. But um, it's, it's not completely clear how effective immortality will happen. I think there are probably several paths. Um, probably, they'll, in practice, they'll be combined. The first is that we manage to reverse engineer enough of biology to put in patches that kind of keep us running biologically indefinitely. That might turn out to be easy. I'm concerned that it'll actually be, trying to be, be like trying to keep a server that's running complex software up for, forever, which is something for which we have absolutely no theoretical framework and lots of potential to run into kind of undecidable problems and, and things like that. The second immortality path is, in effect, uploading to some kind of engineered digital system. And probably this is something that, um, that will happen gradually. I mean, first we'll have digital systems that are directly connected to brains, um, then these 
end up using technology perhaps not that different from the image identif and identify function I was showing you to start kind of learning from our brains and the, and the experiences that we have and taking more of the kind of cognitive load that is currently uh, being implemented by our actual brains until eventually we've got something that responds essentially the same as our brain does. Well, once we've got that, um, we're dealing with something that can evolve quite quickly, uh, independent of sort of the immediate constraints of physics and chemistry, and that can, for example, explore different parts of the computational universe, uh, inevitably sampling parts that are far from what we as humans currently understand. Well, OK, so what is the end state? Um, the, uh, I, I often imagine some kind of strange box of a, of a trillion souls that's some sort of ultimate repository for our civilization. Now, at first we might think, wow, that's going to be such an impressive thing with, uh, with all that intelligence and consciousness and knowledge and so on inside. But I'm afraid I, I don't actually think so. See, one of the things that emerged from my basic science is what I call the principle of computational equivalence, which says, in effect, that beyond some low threshold, all systems are equivalent in the sophistication of the computations they do. So that means that there's not going to be anything sort of abstractly spectacular about the box of a trillion souls. It'll just be doing a computation at the same level as lots of systems in the universe. Maybe that's why we don't see extraterrestrial intelligence, because there's nothing abstractly different about something that came from a whole elaborate civilization as compared to things that are just happening in, in the physical world. Now, of course, we can be proud that our box of a trillion souls is special because it came from us with our detailed history, but uh, will interesting things be happening in it? Well, to define interesting, we then need a sense of purpose, and things become pretty circular, and it's a, it's a, it's a complicated philosophy discussion. And probably, I've, I've come pretty far from talking about um, practical things for 2015. Um, the way I like to work, I, I like to understand uh, sort of fundamentals as deeply as I can, because that's how I've figured out one can sort of build the best, best technology for here and now. Uh, right now, I'm, I'm excited about where we've managed to get in 2015 with, with the Wolfram language. Um, I think we're sort of, the, the goal has been to define kind of a new level of technology to support computational thinking that I think is going to, uh, in the near future, rather quickly let people do some very interesting things, going sort of from algorithmic ideas to finished apps or companies or whatever. And um, all this technology that I've been showing, the Wolfram Cloud and so on, is still, still in beta right now, but, but not for much longer, I hope. Um, but uh, you know, can certainly um, uh, try them out. I hope people will. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's easy to get started, though not surprisingly, because there are actually new ideas. There are things to learn if you really want to take the best advantage of, of this technology. Um, it's, uh, yeah, so, well, that's probably almost all I, I have to say here. Um, I wanted, um, I, I would actually really like to take questions, but we can't logistically do that here. So I gather, so I, in a few minutes, I'm going to be upstairs around the bookstore, and then maybe 4.30 this afternoon, I'll be um, at, like, our trade show booth and so on. But, um, well, thanks for joining me here today. I, I, hope, I hope I've been able to communicate um, a few of the exciting things that we've got going on right now and uh, a few of the things that um, I think are, are, are new and emerging in computational thinking and the technology around it. So thanks very much. There are kids that'll turn 16 and won't go to the driver's license. Yeah. You know, I hear parents frustrated their kids won't get a driver's license. So the, the millennials view cars as a utility, not as a social statement, which is a huge shift for North America. Now, which goes back to you when you said that uh, how, you were talking about how many jobs Uber had created.